All right, for full disclosure before I start this video, I just want to state that I do not believe in background checks and I believe all gun laws are infringement. Um, I'm here today with Rob Pincus, who wrote an article that's causing quite a stir and quite a reaction across the gun world. And there's a lot of questions that have come up because of this article. Some are ridiculous. Some are legit. I'm going to get through as many as possible, and then we're going to see what Rob thinks and get his side out there. I'm not going to commentate on this. I'm not going to put out my opinion besides a little disclaimer at the beginning because you guys need to know where I come, where I'm coming from. All right. So, Rob, thank you for doing this. And I've already yeah. told you it's going to be a probably some tough questions here. And I'm going to give you a chance to get your side out there, and then we're going to go from there. Yeah, let me just, I mean, I'll add to your, I'll join in on your disclaimer, I guess, right? Like, obviously, I think, maybe not some people, but all gun laws are infringements. The Second Amendment's pretty clear, right? Shall not be infringed. Any hoop, any burden, any tax, any background check, anything is in opposition to that very clear, could be clearer, obviously, if you take out that militia clause, but it's a pretty clear statement, right? Shall not be infringed. That part's very clear. And obviously, I believe in that. And I say, obviously, because I think you and I have talked about these things before. The question is, well, OK, but that's not where we are, right? So so we got 100 okay. years almost now of gun control and rights restriction very well entrenched in this country. Yeah. And we got some work to do to get back to shall not be infringed. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. If you give me the power, I'm taking away the gun rights uh, infring infringements tomorrow. And what that's going to give us is an acceptance that freedom is dangerous and freedom's, freedom brings risk. And we need to exercise our freedoms responsibly and, and accept that, that sometimes evil happens. Sometimes there's negative outcomes and deal with it. But, but our country is not there today. And I think that's really important to understand in, in regard to why that article was written and why I think yeah. it was important. All right, let me get to some of these questions. Uh, some of these questions you can just say no because... Um, you think they're uh, probably no? You think no is probably the answer? Yeah. Do you work for the government? No. Do you work for any anti-gun organizations? No. Are you auditioning for a spot in the government on a Biden like gun task force or anything like that? No, I'm not, even, I'm not aware of any such task force, nor would I audition for it. I don't even know what, I, what that would mean. If, if there's an audition for any job, it's like, I don't even have an up-to-date LinkedIn. I'm pretty sure it's, you know, go look at what I do every day for 20 plus years. That's why. Right. Do you really believe that there's no culture war? I think that there, the, the, what was being addressed in that, that jointly written article at Amalan is getting so much attention is this idea that, there's a 50-50 split on whether or not gun-related deaths, suicide, homicide, whatever, are okay or not, right? And, and I've characterized this before as the idea that if you walk into the mall and there's two people collecting money in buckets and one says, shall not be infringed, and the other one says, we want to save kids' lives, most human beings are going to be more inclined to put the money in that we want to save kids' lives bucket, right? The reality is that we, I think, I'm going to speak for myself, I believe, uh, you can maybe chime in on this one, uh, but that having guns allows us to protect, to protect kids' lives. I believe that the work I do to encourage parents with kids and guns to secure their guns from their kids getting them unauthorized and unsupervised, that saves kids' lives. So, so I believe that we take a lot of actions inside of the gun community to protect kids. But if all we ever do is pound the table and say, shall not be infringed, what don't you understand? We're not going to get a lot of support. And that's that's kind of where the culture war is, right, over shall not be infringed. What isn't a culture war and what I don't think is disputed is that 99 point something percent of Americans would agree, yeah, let's reduce negative outcomes with guns. Now, how we go about that, what we do, that's the conversation that should be happening, not this, this characterization that gun owners don't care about kids. We just care about our guns. That's that's crazy talk. And and that's that culture war doesn't exist. There There is not a group of Americans that's OK with kids dying. There's not a group of Americans that's like OK with 30,000 plus people a year dying be, with firearms involved suicide. Like that's the, show me that group and I'll admit I'm wrong, but I don't think that culture war exists. 
And that's what, especially on the gun control side, people would have you believe. They would have you believe that there's a whole bunch of gun owners that just don't care about protecting lives, which is the exact. You talk about suicide with guns. Why not talk about talk all about suicides? Because I'm not a suicide activist, right? Like that's not my job. If 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 people like, I'll give you an example, right? People say, well, if if you can't get a gun, you're just going to jump off a tall building. Okay. I got it. Except right now, if I had a suicidal impulse, I can open up that quick access safe and have a loaded gun in my hand in like less than 30 seconds. It's going to, I mean, there aren't that many buildings tall enough, even in Denver to kill it. I would feel like, oh, I'm going to die if I jump off this building and I don't know how to get on the roof and they're Do you all have bleach in your house. So, so what's that? Do you have bleach in your house? Yeah. Do you know what the success rate with, with poisoning is? It's like, it's like 0.3%. So, so, well, and it's a great right, with firearms as well. Right? So here's the point. I'm not arguing in favor of one method of suicide or not. What I'm saying is if you want to, if you want to go put like the, those nets that they put on uh, aircraft carriers, you know, like in case people fall off, if you want to go put those nets around every tall building, go for it. If you want to put tall walls around every train track so nobody can jump from a train, I don't care. I care about you trying to restrict gun rights because of firearms involved suicide. So that's why I talk. That's why we at Walk the Talk US, we get this all the time. Walk the Talk America, if you go to at Walk the Talk US, we get this all the time. Well, why are you doing we talk about gun involved suicides? Because we're gun rights people. We care about people using the fact that there's so many gun involved suicides against us to restrict our rights. That's what we care about. So if we can reduce the number of firearms involved suicides, A, fewer suicides, B, harder to attack guns. I think that's just obvious. All right, because um, one of the things that a lot of people brought up it, in the conversations is suicide rates compared to the United States compared to other places mm-hmm. around the world, where we actually have a lower suicide rate than people in places like Japan, places like England, and a lot of other first world countries. And I think you talking about you know su- gun suicides that ticked off a bunch of people instead of attacking your they they felt that you were attacking the tool instead of attacking the issue. Yeah, I don't like the, I don't even like the term gun suicides, right? So I say gun, I don't like gun deaths. I don't like like uh, any of that gun violence, right? Like firearms involve violence, gun involve suicide, whatever you want to call it. I prefer those terminologies, but let me say again, I'm a gun rights advocate. I'm a gun owner. I care about guns. I don't care about suicides. And that may come off wrong for some people. Like there's some people I work with in the mental health community that cringe every time I say that. But like, I'm honestly not here to, if, if I do believe, I, let's take Louis Auerbach, right? Louis Auerbach was a friend. He's a mentor. He's a hero to a lot of people in the firearms training community. He took his own life with a gun. And the attitude of a lot of his friends was, you know what, that that's how Louis wanted to go out. He was he did not want other people pitying him. He was in an advanced stage of cancer. He had, he'd gotten the word from the doctor that there really wasn't much that could be done. He didn't want people to be having to carry him around or see him suffer. He didn't probably want to suffer. And he took his own life with a gun. And he now counts as one of the firearms involved suicides. And, and, and losing him as a mentor and as a friend wasn't cool. And and the fact that there was a firearm involved, like I get it, that was his choice to, to go out that way. But I, I have to look at it as, wow, that's going to potentially be used against us. A guy who, who preached firearms responsibility and preached firearms care and, and preached taking care of yourself and defending yourself and fighting took his own life with a gun. And maybe that was in an impulsive moment, or maybe it was long considered. But but what's important to understand is that conversation impacts the gun community. And if he had used bleach or jumped in front of a train or jumped off a, a tall building, it wouldn't impact the gun community in those negative ways. It would just be that incredibly negative loss of a friend and a mentor. And, and we could focus on that and not the politics of he chose to use a gun. Yeah. So, so I do think it's important to understand why I focus on firearms involved suicide and not just generally suicide, because I don't think that it's, it's, self-evident that someone shouldn't have the right to take their own life. I'm not anti-euthanasia. What I am anti is someone using the gun to create that negative outcome. I read the article several times um, over, and you said that you're not for background checks. The article clearly calls for universal back uh, enhanced background checks. Okay, let's be clear about that because I keep I keep running into this. You can't find the word universal in there. Uh, and enhanced. I corrected myself, enhanced. I know, but and explicitly, there's uh, several different pieces there you can see that are calling for protecting private transfers to a significant degree with exceptions, exemptions, the idea that 
if there are millions of people that you or I can transfer a gun to privately, it becomes impossible to have a gun registry or a comprehensive list of gun owners. And that's what I'm proposing. That's what I'm lobbying for, right? So, so the idea of creating a dialogue, right? A lot of people have said in the aftermath, well, if you would have put all that in there, yeah, well, I could put a whole bunch of stuff in there, right? But it, an article is only going to be so long. It's only going to establish a, a premise in this case that there, that a dialogue needs to happen and there are people willing to have that dialogue. Give me a call. Let's have it. But what what is missing from that article, I'll admit, like freely, what it what might have helped, although I still contend that there's some people who are going to write their hit pieces. And, and any if I said tomorrow that all gun laws are infringements in a New York Times op-ed, they would say I was selling out to the liberal media. I mean, it's just, you know, that's that comes with the territory. I get it. So if I had listed what those exemptions are that I'm proposing, and by the way, that Dan agrees with most of them, I can give you the list here in a second if you want. If I'd have listed that, it might have stemmed off some of this, right? But but to okay. conflate a, a, a call for exemptions to background checks that are not this this nefarious, you know, meeting a guy in the back of the Walmart parking lot, selling a gun to a known prohibited person, straw purchase kind of thing. Okay. That's important. Yeah, but, but you said the exemptions are like like family members and stuff like that. So I are not, you I did, I did not. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. What, I, I, that's in not... the in the article it said uh what it said like family members, your neighbor, like uh what uh, it's it, it listed some of them. I'm not saying all of them, but I'm, I'm giving an example. People that you know, there is no comprehensive list there. I think what you got to remember the, the the article. And this is another important point, right? Like the article wasn't found in a diary somewhere, right? People are acting like this is WikiLeaks or Gunny Leaks or whatever the hell. Like I made a conscious decision to to not only contribute to the piece because it is co-written, but then to publish it at the widest read, highest trafficked firearms related blog on the internet. Like that was not a rash decision. That was a considered decision. That article was, was read and, and I'll say vetted by many people in the gun community and the gun, uh, gun rights organizations before it was published. Some of their input was in there and some of the, the, the verbiage. And the choice to force this conversation by publishing it there was, was made in like a so but like many over many sober moments right so so that article going out people are acting like ah look we found out the truth it's like well wait a minute i published the article guys yeah. there's nothing secret here could it have been more comprehensive sure but the idea wasn't to create a comprehensive article the idea was to create a dialogue and that's what's happening okay i want to get back to the background check stuff you said this should be exceptions um do you believe that all background checks should be abolished like yes. next and everything abolished. Yes. And, and let's right. look at constitutional carry. Okay. But for example, I think all permits should be abolished. But in 1995, the entire community was super excited about shall issue laws. Those were shall issue laws that mandated training, that mandated background checks to exercise a civil right. But in the late 80s, we had 13, 12, 13 states where you couldn't even get a permit. So when Texas puts in a very restrictive and specific license to carry program that's shall issue, everybody celebrated. Nobody would be taken seriously today advocating for a shall issue mandatory training, mandatory back, background check permit system today because we're in the era of constitutional carry. But it took us 20 years to get here. Right. So so what I see is, yeah, I would love this have background checks go away. But if today we could have exemptions for millions of people that give us back, in Colorado. Right. I'm not I'm a Florida resident, but I have a place in Colorado. Colorado residents can't do private transfers. Exemptions to the prohibition against private transfers would instantly bring freedom to Colorado residents and many other states where you can't do private transfers. And the way I envision them would get rid of the interstate border, the interstate border crossing prohibition. So that I could privately transfer a firearm to somebody who has a concealed carry permit in Kentucky with, as a Florida resident. I could privately transfer a firearm to someone in Colorado who has a concealed carry permit in Colorado or who can legally carry would be the way I would say it because that gets us all the constitutional states too. So we've got, if everyone who can legally carry a gun in their home state of residence can have a gun privately transferred to them outside of the purview of the government, that instantly adds freedom to millions of gun owners. And yet the, I'm being attacked because I'm suggesting this in the context of a broader conversation about really ending negative outcomes related to guns. But the article called for 
enhanced background checks. What do you think that means? Because I'm curious, because I don't, because it's not defined in the article. So what are you reading into it besides universal? It's not my, it's not my uh, job here to, to answer okay. questions. Well, I'm trying to different. figure out what you meant by enhanced background because, checks. Because here's the thing. What, a, what, what did you mean by enhanced background checks? How about that? Is I'll that a clear you, question? First of all, the article doesn't call for them. The article makes a comparative statement that says it's best. And when, when we look at what's on the table, magazine capacity limits, the ending of private transfers, regulation around gun making, uh, assault weapon bans. When we look at what's on the table, right? And you want to make a comparative statement. If you've got like liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, and water ice, and you say, which is warmer? And you say, oh, ice is warmer. That doesn't mean ice is warm. It doesn't mean ice is hot. It doesn't mean that you want to like cover yourself in ice when it's cold outside. It just means ice is warmer than liquid nitrogen, a self-evident fact. I believe it's a self-evident fact, as does Dan Gross, who co-wrote the article, that a background check is self-evidently not as foolish and ridiculous a gun law as a magazine capacity ban or a assault weapons ban. That doesn't mean I'm pro background check. Now, Dan may very well tell you that he is pro background check. And as the article states, they're playing play. And as every time he and I do anything together, we disagree on a whole bunch of stuff. I'm anti background check. He's pro background check. We can have a conversation around that. And, and people don't seem to get that. So here's a, here's an enhancement to the. Are you willing? Are you willing to compromise? Compromise on what? I don't even understand. I'm you, asking. You, for you, ta you talked about. Uh, you said you know basically the the best worst outcome. You said you know mm -hmm. uh, basically you just said that enhanced background checks are better than assault weapons ban and everything. Absolutely. Are you willing to compromise to stave off an assault weapons ban by agreeing to enhanced background checks? No, and I don't think that's on the table. See, this is another fallacy in that runs around in the gun community. There's no, I'm not invited to a meeting. If you're invited to the meeting, let me know. But I'm unaware of a meeting where, where like some gun owners say, okay. okay, we'll give you this, but we want this back. I'm unaware of that. Okay, let's say if there was that meeting, would you, would you agree to enhance background checks to get assault, an assault weapons ban off the table? No, I don't believe, because I don't, who has that, who can have that meeting? You're no, like, but if, if it did, if it did, okay. would you? Is it literally Jesus or, or is it, uh, is it, if okay, it did, would you? Uh, an ask guardian that comes down from, no, like, no, the art who is the guy that says, we promise we're never going to try to do an assault weapons ban okay. if you agree to this? I no, wouldn't buy it. I'm like, trying to figure out where your line is. Would you, Agreed to enhance background checks to get an assault weapons ban off the table. No, I don't think that I don't think that's a rational concept. Like I don't so 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 I can't because I wouldn't I would not believe that anybody sitting across the table. Okay, let's 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 let's, let's say let's say hypothetically that was possible. I'm trying to find out where your line in the sand yeah. is. No, well, line in the sand is a silly term. It just it's silly. It's what people who are compromising today. And complying today say to sound tough. They say they have a line in the sand. I don't believe that. Clown, every clown in the gun community that's saying shall not comply while they're filling out 4473s and, and paying tax stamps, why aren't they being called hypocritical traitors? Why aren't they being called out on their bullshit? Because honestly, 99.9% .9 of the gun because, community because fills I out think 4473s, every one of them that says shall not comply is a clown. I think there is a line in the line in the sand where it says, okay, we, we complied. If we keep on giving up rights, we're going to keep on losing rights. So let's but stop it right here, right and now. No more. Up? What rights have you given up, John Crumb? I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to okay, ask questions. Right, That's right, I've, given, I've given up no rights. I have, I have, I have acquiesced to no gun law. I'm complying with gun laws in the same way I comply with a tax law or I comply with uh, if a private business asks me to wear a mask and I want to go in and do business with it, I'm going to comply. I don't think I the mask helps me. I don't think they should require masks to go into the building. But if yeah. that's what you're doing and I want to be a customer, then I'll put the damn mask on. Like I, I You don't think that's giving up rights? I don't think TSA by complying with rights. By complying you don't think it's giving up rights by not actively by letting the government infringe on those rights? I, I don't okay, so what, what do you mean by letting? So 99.9% .9 of the gun community is filling out 4473s. Are they letting the government do it? I mean, yeah, in a practical yes, sense, they are, but philosophically, are. I'm fighting against the idea 
uh, background checks philosophically. Where, where you, is your line in the sand? What won't you comply I, I, with? I think it's a flawed, it's a silly concept. What, what like, won't you comply with? Is there anything that you won't comply with? In the audience and social media to say you have a line in the sand. It is infantile. Yeah. I'll know is what you'll know what a line in the sand is when I am standing on the, the state Supreme Court, the, the National Capitol Mall, wherever I'm standing, when I'm standing there with an SBR saying, you know what, enough is enough. If you want to arrest me, arrest me. And I'm there in peaceful civil disobedience. Then you'll know, like you got, you found my line in the sand. Is, is there any law that you won't comply with? Sorry. Is there any law that you won't comply with? There are laws I don't comply with now. Okay, uh, gun, gun laws. Like if they enacted a uh, assault weapon, a so-called assault weapons ban tomorrow. Again, you're asking me crazy hypotheticals that are. Chi it's a child's game. Well, it's it's what, not what, hypothetical. What? I'm trying to figure out where you what stand, you right and now? it seems like you're dodging the question. Well, it's a, it's a it's a silly question. Again, I will you will know it's 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 what is perverted, right? What is or what uh, perverted isn't the right term, but the, the, um, obscene. You know, you know obscenity when you've seen it. When you see it, you can't necessarily describe it. This is a, that's an infamous, cliched reference. I get it, but again, I think the concept of a line in the sand is what children do to sound tough on the internet. Uh, when you'll know when you know, and what you know what you don't know. You don't know which laws I'm complying with or not complying with selectively now. And I don't know about Fair you. Enough. And it's something a lot of people say, and I get that. But here's the problem. I'm not saying shall not comply. I'm not wearing a t-shirt that says will not comply while I'm filling out 4473s, while I hold an FFL, while I have an SOT, while I'm, I'm registered uh, as I, a of, of suppressors. I'm not pretending I'm a tough guy on the internet. And that's what I, I think you're conflating complying with current laws and saying that it has to end. You're not going to, you already been pushed so far. I agree. I'm saying it has to end. And what I'm saying is we're going to work towards it ending just like the prohibition on concealed carry in Texas ended. Right. And just like Texas might eventually get to permitless carry, right? We're, we're working in that direction. We're regaining lost rights. So let's go back to enhanced background. Here, here's an enhancement to background checks. Private transfers should be legal across state borders for people that are legally able to carry in their home state, people that are active, retired, or uh, what do you call it? Reserve law enforcement, people who are active or reserve or National Guard or retired military, people who are members of the same shooting club, people who are members of the same competition, shooting competition league, plus all the family exemptions, right? Immediate family, cohabitators, intimate partners, right? So if you take, if you just, you just take the list I just rattled off, that means millions of people I should be able to legally transfer a gun to, regardless of state borders, regardless of the type of firearm it is, because those people are already exempted from every and all background checks. I think that's an enhancement. I think mandating the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Farms and Explosives must invest resources in following up on every denied background check, because if we're going to have a background check system that nobody, that you get, you know, 2% are followed up on, that's a problem. So let's well, start following up on it. So mandate, I think that's an enhanced background. Okay. Check. I, I, I really disagree with that. Um, I'll tell no. you why. Uh, you I, 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 I'm well, I, I've done some studies um, and, and I actually read an article about this. Uh, the ATF has, um, they have leeway on what they follow up on. So if you committed a nonviolent felony, at age of 18 and you're currently 70, which actually happens and he was denied, they decided, Hey, this guy's probably not a danger. He hasn't committed any crime since he was 18. But that's an investigation, right? That's a follow-up. That, so that's fine. Uh, that, that's what I'm talking about. Right? Well, the follow-up in the ATF purview is actually showing up instead of looking at the, 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 looking at what it is and filing it away. Well, are you telling me that in that case, that person who's 70 gets to buy the gun? No, he didn't get to buy the gun, but they didn't follow up on it. A follow up in the ATF in the ATF purview is showing up and and, and actually doing an interview. We can debate the semantics of it. What I'm no, I'm, I'm I'm just, I'm just saying this is in the ATF documentation. Okay, so, so in in Rob's world of an enhanced background check, it requires more than that, and it requires either that you say, yeah, that person knowingly tried to buy a gun, even though they knew they were a prohibited person and we're going to prosecute or that person, it was a mistake and we're going to get them off the list 
Or guess what's probably going to happen? The ATF's probably going to say, whoa, 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 this is overwhelming. This is ridiculous. And it's not really doing us any good because most of it is stuff like you just mentioned or mistakes. So let's just get rid of the background check system because this is not working. That This is the direction I think that we move when we actually, I'll give you an example here in Colorado. Here in Colorado, there's a magazine capacity ban, right? There's a magazine capacity ban. I posted a video the other night of what sure looked like it was probably a full capacity magazine coming off my 3D printer made here in Colorado. You can go to any gun shop, even here in Denver, even a week after a high profile mass shooting and find 30 round, I saw 50 round magazines for sale on a shelf at a shop last week. That You can find all the magazines because guess what? Nobody's enforcing the law. Guess what that means? Nobody's fighting the law. So the law sits on the books until the next governor or the next superintendent of the state police or the next local chief of police that wants to start trying to enforce it. And now you've got a whole bunch of instant felons in Colorado who were complacent with a law that never should have existed in the first place. So when I say enhanced background check would include in Rob's world, the need to follow up on these denials, it's to say we as a gun community are really good at being complacent about laws that don't immediately affect us. It's how we lost bump stocks. Not enough people cared. It's why I'm campaigning to make gun making mainstream and to have the gun makers match and have a do it yourself section at NSSF SHOT Show. The idea is if more people are doing it and more people are engaged in it and more people see the value and the fun of that gun making hobby, the educational experience, the freedom experience of it, then we will be less likely to lose it. Right. If it's all guys in balaclavas shooting guns that break after the third shot, we're going to lose it. Right. So. So, again, there's a strategy here. It's a nuanced strategy. It's a complex strategy. It's a strategy that requires more than just caring about what the audience thinks. And that's what pisses people off. I get it. But guys, I mean, John, you've known me for a long time. I've been doing this for a long time. If somebody's still expecting me to do shall not be infringed memes, like you're, you're, you're looking for the wrong thing. I'm not that advocate. And I don't even think those guys are advocates most of the time. Do you believe in the gun show loophole? There is. The, the, I don't believe in the term loophole. The term loophole annoys the crap out of me because it implies that somebody's working around a law, like nefariously, as opposed to just simply following the law. Braced pistols. Braced pistols aren't a loophole. Braced pistols are following the law, right? They're complying as opposed to putting a stock on your AR with a short barrel and having a, an SBR and not paying the tax stamp. So the idea that somebody privately sells a gun at a gun show where it's legal to privately sell a gun at a gun show is going through a loophole is, is ridiculous. So I don't know what you, so, so no, I, I don't believe that should be illegal. I don't know what, I don't really know what you meant by do I believe in the gun show loophole. I, I criticize that phrasing wherever I hear it. I think, I, you remember Crowder, the crowd, the comedian? So the comedian guy, went to a gun show and like tried to prove the gun show loophole doesn't exist a few years ago and did this funny video that everybody shared. Well, the problem was it was really disingenuous. A, like he sort of entertained the concept of the gun show loophole as being a thing. And then B, he went to licensed dealers and facetiously said, what, you mean I have to have a background check? So there is no gun show loophole and ignored the fact that what we should be doing is talking about and celebrating the right to privately transfer at a 4-H club coliseum or wherever you are at the local high school gym, wherever your gun show is. The fact that we can privately transfer guns should be celebrated. We should be talking about the fact that it's legal and, and fine and it's freedom and it's private property and private transactions. We shouldn't be acting as if we have no idea what people are talking about when they say gun show loophole and acting like you can't do private transfers at a gun show. We should be okay. defending the private transfers at a gun show. So it's a, it's a, it's a bad term. Okay. Uh, I know you, you only have about 30 minutes um, totals, but so I want to get to a couple of these questions that are kind of important. Uh, <laughs> I'm, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure if we've gotten the ridiculous ones or if the ridiculous ones are coming up. No, no, the ridiculous ones are 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 gone. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, uh, in the article there was a lot of double speak in there, and I hear a lot of double speak in this interview. Um, why is there so much double speak? Like really obscure language. And you mean, you mean, I mean, I, I, that's sort of a that's like a trap question. I don't even know why. Like, I, a, I don't think there is. So, so give me an example, and then I'll give you a, I'll give you a response. All right, like you like, like you weren't uh, very clear on enhanced background checks, for example. You're like, no, I don't believe in not being clear. Double speak. You see what I'm saying? Like this is exactly how uh, double speak is, is obscure language. Get fired up. 
right? Like somebody's gonna be like, Rob Pink has used double speak. John Crumb said so. But you just you just said I wasn't clear. No, do, yeah, you used obscure language. Okay, do you think you use double speak? How about that? No, I said that. Okay. But if All you right. give me an example, I mean, I, you know, like I said, it's, it's a collaborative work, right? So if you, if you see a sentence and you see another sentence in there that you think contradicts something earlier said, yeah. tell me, and I'll gladly address it. Okay. But I know. Okay. Double speak. Okay. Okay. Um, here's another question. I heard from someone, um, and I'm not sure if this is true. So this might this might be one of the ridiculous okay, questions. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm already characterizing this as a ridiculous one. But go ahead. Well, well, this is one of the questions that I put yeah. in in that category that I forgot that it's actually in my other questions. So it maybe should have been up there. Okay. The secret questions. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, I I try to get like, are you a government agent? All that out front, but this one right, was, not, was originally I, up there, but it wasn't. Um, I someone people are saying that. Uh, the 2AO, the Second Amendment organization, which you which you were like executive VP of, yeah, um, did not want their name on the article. And uh, is that true, or is that just made up? I that I don't even, I, a I don't remember if it is even there or not. I don't think it is. Um, no, it's not. No, yeah, but the, it, uh, it, it wasn't a 2AO article. Like it wasn't a two AO. It was like Rob Pincus and Dan Gross writing this thing, Center for Gun Rights and Responsibility. Right. I, now I will say that the entire board reviewed that article before it went public, and they all, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that the entire board agreed with everything in there. The entire board supported the idea of me being involved in that article and it being published, knowing that there would be potentially a firestorm or at least a lot of controversy over the fact that that those things were even being said in public. Right. So, so a, I don't think two AO's name is on it. B that was vetted by the board. They knew it was going to be published. C therefore no, they, they didn't have to ask not to have their name on it because it wasn't meant to have their name on it. Uh, it there's actually another question that was supposed to be up there too. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you that talked was, about, you that, talked about urban, urban areas. Were you talking about black areas? Uh, and, and why not just come out and say black areas if that's what you I, meant? Well, again, sounds like a trap. Like, would, would you, do, you know, do you beat your no, wife? I mean, that, that's a, that's uh, something that people have been floating out there. So I want to okay, get hey, off the top. I, I, there was, I don't know what what exactly was that in regard to the uh, bad actors inside of like like known, known gun dealers that have a lot of straw purchases and a lot of yeah. okay yeah so the urban reference is to inner city violent crime I think it's disingenuous to say black crime is it true that a lot of that crime involves racial minorities sure but that you could have Hispanic gangs you can have black gangs you can have white biker gangs. Uh, white biker gangs tend to be more in rural areas. So when we when we look at and I and again, this is something where this is another area where Dan and I disagree. He uses the term and I, I think it was edited out of the article. I'm 99 percent sure he wanted, you know, he, when he originally he, he uses this term bad apple gun dealers a lot. Right. And and he has in the past and he still uses it. I, I think it's a really goofy term. It's kind of like gun show loophole. It's a term I don't like. It's It's a phrase I don't like. And it goes back to this issue of the ATF following up on. Uh, failed background checks or, you know, one guy doing 59 background checks and then 48 of those guns showing up in the Chicago police department evidence locker within a year. Like there, there's issues that the ATF could be following up on. And there are, there is evidence. There is, there is actual data out there that a very, very, very high number of guns used in crime in urban environments, specific cities is what I'm saying, not, not a cultural thing in specific cities can be tracked back to a very small number of gun dealers. That's odd. Don't you think? Well, like, 90% of guns used in the inner city in crimes or stolen or obtained illegally. Yes. But if obtained legally includes straw purchases that are coming out of one particular gun okay. shop or, or a couple of gun shops. I mean, that to me as a dealer, as a, as a guy in the gun community, I, I'd want to ask that question. If I were the guy who owned that gun shop, I would want to try to figure out, well, gee, that's weird. I don't want to contribute to violent crime in the city. I don't want my customers having their guns stolen. Maybe I'm going to start selling gun safes too, right? Maybe that's the answer. And I'm not saying the government has to be involved in that answer, but I would think that the person who owns that gun shop would want to ask, would want to answer those questions, right? Okay. Want to try to reduce the negative outcomes. So 
in the urban in that context specifically means crime in cities. The, the people question the homicide thing, right? Originally, uh, we, what we were talking about was there's a lot of speculation that suicides are going to be up for 2020 because of the COVID and the isolation and all the craziness and the division in the country and everything happened, right? So I think that's a fair speculation. However, there's no data to support it. So we can't say in this piece, like, gun involved deaths are up. We can say gun involved homicides are up, right? And, and in fact, one of the guys that, that wrote a hit piece that, you know, couldn't wait to get uh, his, his probably most popular article all year written, uh, criticizing me in that, that article on Amaland, he specifically asked me, where do you come up with this? So I sent him like nine links, like, here's where I come up with this. All these, these very credible sources that, that have higher reported violent crime, firearms involved crime and homicides all across the country in major urban environments in cities. There's no racial component to that. It's just, it's a statistical fact. We know it, we're lamenting it. It probably contributes to the rise in gun ownership around the country, which we're celebrating. But it, it, we don't, we aren't celebrating the crime. We're celebrating the fact that people, more people are realizing, hey, owning guns make, make me safer. And I want to get the gun and I want to get the training and I want to become a responsible firearms owner. And I didn't think I would before 2020, but now I'm doing it. That's awesome for the gun community. That's awesome for America. That's awesome for people who like safety and like the reduction of crime. However, you can't deny that, that we look around and we see a rise in increase in violent crime. New York City is probably one of the perfect examples. Chicago is always bad. New York was cleaned up for a couple of decades and now it's getting bad again. You know, so this idea that that violent crime happens in urban environments and guns are involved and often those guns are not. You know, this is the question, right? Like, you notice I don't use law abiding gun owner. Right. I stopped using that term because if all gun laws are unconstitutional, all gun laws are infringements and we shall not comply. Why are we putting value on law abiding gun owner? Right. That's a silly term to use. How about responsible gun owner? Because I don't care if somebody bought their gun illegally and they have kids in their house. I want them to responsibly store that gun around the kids in that house. I don't care that they're a, an illegal gun owner. Because again, if we're going to refute the concept of an illegal gun owner, why are we celebrating law abiding gun owners? How about responsible gun owners? Right. So, so again, yeah. urban environment, rural environment, I don't care. Yeah. Just, just, just for clarification on the suicide rate, there's actually is a study up there and the suicide rates in 2020 increased 7.7 percent where is where is it from and how recently was it released because i honestly in working like it, through Walk talk america it, well, it, 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 uh, i'm gonna be very honest it was just really like in the, in the past couple of days okay. i'll find yeah. it. it i think i found it on the bmj which releases uh medical medical study reports and stuff like that so um that's i'm not saying that you should have had that but that is just released it so i just wanted to make you aware no thank you because that's good like and and really the reason that it, we specifically talk about homicides in that piece that was published last week was because i was unaware of any data that was published on suicides obviously to me suicides is a far more important thing to address than homicides because it's a far more controllable and influenceable uh, thing inside the community and it's two-thirds of the firearms related deaths in our country I mean, again, these numbers, tens of thousands of people, you can barely, you can't say tens of thousands of people die with firearms involved incidents if you oh. take out suicides. Well, wait, here's the thing. You you say that you didn't use the statistics so you didn't have them, but you do use statistics in there by saying that we could cut the, the gun deaths in half by 50%. Yeah. that's Where does that come from? That's, that's a speculative piece of hyperbole, honestly, right? Like if you think about it, this is the kind of thing that, that, that you said, this is how you set an agenda, right? This is how you, you set a, a goal. People, I mean, what like Coca-Cola is in trouble for saying they want to reduce fit plastics involved in their, you know, the plastics that are involved in their business, uh, they want to reduce pollution by 50%. And people are like, well, how could you possibly say that? It's what we want to do, right? I mean, honestly, what do I want? I want to reduce all guns related deaths to zero, right? Because because it should be zero, because zero would mean not only are there no accidents and no suicides of firearms, it would mean there were no homicides of firearms. It would also mean that there's no violent crime attempted to be perpetrated against good guys who have to use guns to defend themselves and end up killing the bad guys. So that would be zero. That'd be cool. I don't I don't think that's within the cards, really. But but that would be cool. So if we can just say, you know what, if we educate awareness, uh, proactive mental health, especially um, prevent theft, prevent unauthorized access to guns. And 
get, get involved with with group affiliated crime interrupters, right? Which which we know as gang people who work to stem gang violence, but the correct terminology, right, is this group affiliated violence interrupters. These organizations that work at with at risk youth in urban environments, right? I mean, you can throw term terminology all day long. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. If you're talking about rural kids that might get sucked into a, a, a meth ring by a white biker gang, or you're talking about urban kids that might get sucked into the, the whatever they perceive as the advantage of being associated with MS-13, either way, if we can interrupt that cycle and get involved and reduce the likelihood that somebody gets involved in violence, period, gun involved or not, that's a positive. So yeah, I, I'm perfectly, we, trust me, that was talked about, right? And I'm the one that's always like, oh, I don't know if like that hyperbole makes any sense, but you got to say something. What are we trying to do here? I, I would love to get a bunch of people on board with how we can, without assault weapon bans, without magazine capacity limits, and without, and in, with, in fact, with expansion of private gun sales, certainly not getting rid of private gun sales, with an expansion of the protection for private gun sales and gun making for that matter, we would reduce gun deaths by 50%. Let's make it 80%. Let's make it 90%, right? How high can we go? But we got to have, we got to throw something out there. Okay. Uh, and the final question, statistic, right? Like that's a goal just to be clear. Yeah. Am I a, an extremist? Are you? Yes. No, dude, you're, you're no, no, you, you, you look at you. You were in a, you were in a hoodie. You just, you're just hanging out. Mr. Amelian. <laughs> well, it is, okay. Fair enough. I know. I don't think you're an extremist. I, I would characterize an extremist as, as somebody who is, you know, we probably don't even really know who the real extremists are, right? Like I can't point to you, I can't say, oh, that guy over there, he's a real extremist because that real extremist is is the one who's like up on the, the hillside somewhere, you know, in a bunker, right? That guy's probably pretty extreme, but he's also probably choosing to live a life where he's non-confrontational and, and not aggravating anybody. And he's just kind of doing his own thing and wants to be left alone. That's, that's pretty extreme. I'm a social guy. I want to be around. I want to get on planes. I want to go visit places. I want to eat out. I want to have a few drinks. I want to date people. Like, I, like I'm not that extreme. In the gun rights world, I, I think it's important to understand that you've got you do have extremes, right? If you think about like a bell curve, you've got people on this end who really do want to take away all the guns and think it's even feasible. But you got people on this end who like today, right now, think we should just snap our fingers and get rid of all the gun laws in our country and that that's a real feasible option. I don't think either one of those things are realistic or feasible. I think those people are delusional, right? Now, the goal of wanting to get rid of all guns, I don't even agree with that. That I think is a flawed premise and I, I don't get it. Over here on this side, the people that have the goal of getting rid of the infringements on our civil rights, yeah, I get it. But if those people really think that means we're gonna have vending machines with, with belt-fed machine guns in the middle school that the kids can buy on their lunch break and use at recess, they're in a fantasy land too. So, so we have to have these conversations about what, what, what's happening in the middle. And this is where I say we don't have a culture war because you've got 2% over here and 2% over here well, you've got 98% or 96% of America left in the middle, not thinking either one of those two things are, are on the playing field. And we all agree that we should be reducing negative outcomes. So, so let's talk about that. There's no culture war over reducing negative outcomes. And that is something that when you talk about it, it puts money in the, in the pockets of the people that, you know, like this HR, uh, which one was it? 127, right? We yeah. all do. Nobody thought one to one, no human being that is anywhere connected to the gun rights world on either side thought 127 had a yeah. chance of going anywhere. And yet, if you noticed, I did try to. Yeah, I did. No, that's why I, this is a common ground. Everywhere. Right? Like, like we don't everywhere always, try to put that out. That, but, that's, the idea, that was not a danger. There was a lot of fundraising done, right? So that got, a, there were a lot of memes or a lot of people. Hey, get, send us money because we're going to have to fight against HR 127. HR 127. Yeah, that, that did kind of piss me off a little bit, by the yeah. way. So, those, so is that extreme? Well, it's it's hyper it's hyperbolic. It's it's fear mongering. It's it's fundraising on the back of fear, which I never like. I like fundraising on the back of awareness and education. And and like, here's the program we want to enhance. Here's the program we want to put in place. And and I get it. We need a war chest. We need the fight in court. And, and that is incredibly important work that people do. And I also understand that, unfortunately, those memes and the fear mongering work to raise money, right? The NRA proved that for two decades. But let's look at where the NRA is today using that methodology, right? They got greedy. They got caught. And now they're they're not even in the, in the, uh, on the playing field. They're too busy, you know, uh, backpedaling and trying to protect themselves from, from getting shut down, dissolved, fined, jailed, whatever. So, so this idea that, well, it works and we make money with this fear mongering doesn't go very. Hey, Rob. 
criticized. Your internet's starting to break up really yeah, bad. So I think, yeah. So whenever I talk really super fast like that, the internet says, whoa, 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 whoa. So anyway, point being, um, the, the fear mongering doesn't work. And I, and I also think that some of the shall not comply, what, what cold dead hands shall not be infringed. A lot of that is, it's not fear mongering, but it's, it's pandering. It's just, it's entertainment. It doesn't, it's not advocacy, right? It's, it's, it's no one on earth that isn't already on our side is compelled by shall not be infringed, right? Like we, and I wrote an article a couple of years ago, like shall not be infringed is not the end. Uh, it, it can't be the, the end all be all of gun rights discussions. It's the first step. I think that's important, right? Anytime anybody asks me like, well, why does anybody need an AR-15? I say, well, need is irrelevant. That's not about need. Well, what, what, why couldn't, why can't you just ban 30 round magazines? Well, the second amendment, that's a good place to start, right? Let's talk about that. We, the second amendment exists. There's a way to change our constitution. If you want to go down that road, good luck. There's a reason none of the gun control organizations or any of the gun control proponents ever recommend going down that road because they know it wouldn't float. Once again, because there is no culture war over the right to keep and bear arms in our country. There are people who have you believe it. There are people that have you believe that there's 51% any given year of people that think we shouldn't have guns. That doesn't exist, right? So if we, if we acknowledge that no one's trying to change constitution because it would never float, it would never, you'd never get two thirds of the state, you'd never get 50% or more of the people in two thirds of the state to support changing the constitution. So what do we get? What are we left with? Well, we're left with let's incrementally try to restrict gun rights. And that's what we're fighting against, right? But yeah, of course, shall not be infringed as part of the conversation. But it's not, it can't be the end all be all, right? You can get acknowledgement at the boardroom table when you're talking to people that might want to take away all the guns. Okay, Second Amendment. Okay, we get it. Good. Now let's talk about 2021 and not 1792. All right. All right. I think that's all I have for you, Rob. Thank you so much. Yeah. I know some of these questions were. I really thought, I thought you were going to ask me like the ultimate ridiculous question. You're not going to do it? What's the ultimate ridiculous question? I thought I did. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the um, what I, I forget, but the answer is 42. Um, the oh, no, that no, that's the that's the uh, oh, meaning of life. Right? Oh man, no, the ridiculous question was when when you you actually did ask me. I don't know if you've ever asked me publicly, I thought you were gonna hit me with it today. You asked me privately last year. Oh, okay, no, when you, had, you, you said that you had heard a rumor that I was soft on gun control because my girlfriend was anti-gun at a yeah. time when I didn't have a girlfriend and <laughs> still don't. And I thought that was truly oh, the most, oh, I, I thought you were going to throw that out. 